Um, welcome everybody to our webinar on uh, Jabal Musa, Archaeology and Heritage in the Lebanese Mountains. My name is Carol Palmer and I am the director of CBRL in Amman. Um, thank you for joining us today for this webinar. For those of you who may not be familiar with uh, our organization, we are the Council for British Research in the Levant, CBRL for short, a research charity and membership organization, a learned society that conducts, supports and facilitates humanities and social sciences research on the Levant or Levantine Middle East. We are one of the British Academy's um, seven or eight um, British International Research Institutes, and we receive core funding via the British Academy for our activities, but we also fundraise and depend on our members and other bodies who support us very much indeed. And we're grateful to everybody who attends or gives money or donates to support and develop additional research projects and activities. We have an office in London at the British Academy, and I'm speaking today from Amman, where we have the British Institute in Amman. Um, this is now something we say standard, but I think webinars are here to stay. In normal times, we organize uh, regular programs of lectures at our institutes that people can come and attend. Um, but during uh, the pandemic, we've developed a particularly series of, of uh, webinars, and it's been a fantastic opportunity for us to reach out around the world and reconnect and connect with new people in what we do. And we hope uh, that as the pandemic hopefully ends in the future, we will maintain webinars and have blended um, hybrid events in future. So please do uh, sign up to be on our mailing list to keep uh, connected with us if you're not already on our mailing list or a member uh, in future so that we can uh, stay in touch and, uh, and you can join us and suggest and be involved even in future webinars and events. Uh, we hope very much that you enjoy today's webinar and um, that you will join us again in future. Uh, we have a website, please do continue to check our website for future events um, going forward and to get monthly updates on all our events and news items and blogs and publications. We publish two journals as well, Levant and Contemporary Levant. Uh, please do look at our website and sign up for more activities. Um, I'm just going to say something about our uh, sort of house rules. This is a panel discussion today. We're very excited to have four speakers with us. And so each speaker will speak in turn um, and, um, and will then be followed by a discussion led by one of our speakers where you'll be invited to put questions in the Q&A of the Zoom. Um, and uh, so we're very much looking forward to the feedback from everybody joining us today and questions and answers. If you have any um, technical issues or you'd just like to say hello, do share that uh, in the chat. Please do, for your questions, try to keep those short and generally one question per person. And we will read out the names of people in the Q&A unless otherwise um, you would prefer to remain anonymous. So for today, it's my pleasure to introduce our speakers. Um, so we have representatives from Lebanon as well as from, uh, from actually New Zealand and, and uh, the US. Um, our archeologists are based uh, outside the region currently. Um, so to start with Pierre Dume, who is a founding member and currently the president of the Association for the Protection of Jabal Musa, APJM, as you'll find it referred to today. 
Although he has a, holds a volunteer position, Pierre dedicates, he says, more of his time and effort in managing APJM than he does on managing the three other companies that he directs. He is actually renowned in Lebanon for his work in the private sector, and he has brought that professionalism and focus to the not-for-profit um, domain in running APJM. Under his management, uh, Jabal Musa has been designated a biosphere reserve um, in 2009, so just over 10 years, and has become one of the most important ecotourism destinations in Lebanon, receiving a growing number of visitors every year. Uh, his colleague, um, Joel Barakat is conservation manager at AJPM and born and raised in Yashush, one of the villages in the biosphere reserve. Joel has been working for APJM for eight years now, uh, competently overseeing projects pertaining to the research, to the conservation of natural as well as cultural heritage and sustainable development and local outreach. So our two archeologists are first of all, uh, Dr. Jenny Bradbury, who is an assistant professor at Bryn Mawr College in, in the USA. She's actually got a long history with CBRL. I'm pleased to say she's a former CBRL committee member, as well as fellow. Uh, previously, and her main research interests focus on um, social complexity. Um, she describes them as not of non-optimal zones, meaning for agriculture, sort of a more peripheral areas than you might, uh, than key sort of agricultural areas, burial traditions, and mortuary practices. She's a landscape archaeologist specializing in uh, GIS, uh, Geographical Information Systems, and Archaeological Survey Techniques and Cultural Heritage. She has uh, done, a, she's an active field archaeologist with a wide range of um, experience. She's worked in Lebanon, Jordan, Kuwait, Oman, and Syria. And since 2018 has been working in collaboration with the APJM on an archaeological and heritage field survey that she's going to talk to us about today. And then our second archaeologist joining us from um, New Zealand currently uh, is uh, Dr. Stephen McPhillips, who is a landscape archaeologist whose research interests focus on rural society and hydro agricultural and ceramic technologies of medieval and, and Ottoman periods. He has worked on projects in Lebanon, Jordan and Syria and the Arabian Gulf and was an assistant professor at the University of Copenhagen, a fellow at the University of Bonn as well. And he's currently working as an independent consultant for the Jabal Musa Biosphere on the APJM project, working on the archaeological and heritage field survey since 2000. And 18 with Jenny and team, and we're going to start off today with uh, Pierre, who's going to speak to us first. Thank you very much. Enjoy, and see you later on in this um, today's event. Hi, everyone. Um, this is more intimidating to me than I thought it would be, so please, if it's not completely smooth, forgive me. Uh, next slide, yes. Um, so um, I think these are Joel's slides. Yes, Joel? Are they your slides? This is my slide. Okay, so I want to talk to you today about the Man and Biosphere Program. Uh, it's not a very well-known UNESCO program. The, the most known UNESCO cultural program is the cultural, uh, the, uh, the heritage site program. The heritage site is a program whereby you have a very important, let's say, archeological, or cultural place that's kind of fenced in 
or there's a wall around it and people visit it. It's, it's a very well-known program. The Man and Biosphere program is less well-known, but it's kind of interesting. So what I thought to do today was just give you a bit of information about it since it's celebrating its 50th year. And I think today it's even more relevant than 50 years ago and should be more and more relevant in the future as we lose habitat for nature and culture and uh, there's a need for this kind of program. So the Man and Biosphere program is, uh, has three essential principles. Number one is conservation of nature and culture. Number two is as much research as possible to enhance the value of the, the context of the place that's being protected. But number three is, as opposed to fencing it in or keeping people trickling in to visit and leave, the concept is to have sustainable development for the people inside the reserve so that they are motivated to conserve. This is really the key issue of the Man and Biosphere program. So uh, I, like I learned like a few years ago in a, in a workshop, a Spanish lady explained it to a young person, uh, explained to me what it looks like. Instead of having a bell all over the thing, instead of boxing it in and keeping it conserved so it's a protected area, we should consider a biosphere reserve as a protecting area that embraces, embraces uh, the birds and the bees and the forests and the flowers and the mammals and also embraces the human beings inside this protecting area. That's what makes this concept incredibly interesting and at the same time incredibly challenging because you see that you have to actually uh, balance you have to balance the interests of these um, constituents that are, are not necessarily uh, on the same wavelength. So let's move to the next slide, please. Uh, I'm going to go through these slides quickly because uh, Joel will do a much better job at explaining what we actually do. I want to just tell you how it's complicated to run this kind of environment where you have conflicting interests. And it's been explained through the theory of complex social ecological systems where you have non-linearity, you have surprise shocks and disturbances and so you have to be very resilient. Resilient towards the different component by being flexible, learning quickly and have an ability when there is a crash to recover. The next slide, please. Uh, and so what they have uh, kind of invented or conceived is two types of management. The first one is the adaptive management. So you have a lot of problems and issues and threats, and of course also opportunities. You adapt your vision to those, you implement. If there are any difficulties, and there are always difficulties or opportunities, you change your plan, you update it, and you try again. Adaptive management approach to biosphere reserve. Next slide, please. There's another um, approach which is called the collaborative management because of course, when you have all these constituents involved, you're going to have to have government bodies involved, the research institutions and universities, the NGOs, of course, in our case, this NGO is the kind, kind of the managing entity. And most important, you got to have the communities inside the concept. So you, you're gonna act as a facilitator or an integrator. The next slide, please. So what they're saying is basically to run a biosphere reserve, you need to have adaptive, like we said, adaptive management, adaptive co-management. You involve the communities, you have a socio-ecological approach, you integrate the objective, you monitor and you develop a shared vision that evolves. Does this work? The next slide, please. It doesn't really work. There are many barriers to success, okay? There is lack of collaboration by the entities. There's often a lack of clear objectives. There's often a lack of leadership of a favorable regulatory environment and a lack of funding. So what is the solution to this kind of complex management? The next slide, please. And this is my last slide. We have developed something we call the helicopter perspective which uh, we are exercising tonight, for example. The helicopter perspective is where you have the community itself. So it's participative and adaptive at the level of the community itself, the grassroots, like Joel, she's from Yashu, she's the community right here representing her community. And then you have world-class affiliations, 
like being with you people out there. A lot of you have been here, have worked here with us, and you are world class. So this is our solution is that like a helicopter that needs to hover constantly between the grassroots and the international knowledge and, and, and uh, know-how that can be found, as well as the, of course, the organizations, the EU, the, uh, the United Nations, etc. We try to keep hovering between the community's needs and what we can get from international organization in terms of training, twinning, fundraising, and knowledge, very important. And we think this approach is relatively unbeatable. It's a bit exaggerated, but uh, this is the way we see it. So thank you very much. That was my part, uh, maybe a bit too theoretical, but I have fun doing this stuff. Thanks a lot. I, I guess this is my last slide, folks, sorry. I wanted to say that we are exercising what I just discussed in a new kind of cluster inside the Man and Biosphere program, because the Man and Biosphere program is now organized around the Arab Man and Biosphere, the European Man and Biosphere, the African Man and Biosphere. Then we have something called Iberomab for the uh, uh, South America and, uh, and, uh, and Spain. And the last one is South, uh, South Asia Pacific. So we are creating, we are, we are part of founding this wonderful new cluster, which is the Mediterranean Biosphere Reserve, where we find that when we hover, we enjoy very much hovering to Mediterranean countries because we have this unity of nature, a lot in common in the Mediterranean basin, and unity of culture, of course, with the Phoenicians and Greeks and Romans, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Sorry. Thanks again. Thank you. Uh, now I'm going to start uh, uh, about the environmental value and how it makes sense uh, with the concept that Pierre now uh, talked about, the UNESCO Biosphere Reserve concept. Next slide, please. Um, uh, first, I'm going to start with the first particularity of Jabal Musa. I would like to first mention that Jabal Musa is located in Mount Lebanon uh, in the in Kisirwen area. Uh, it's, uh, it's the altitudes really go up very quickly from 350 meters to 1,000 to, uh, to 1,700 meters, which really um, is a very particularity of Jabal Musa because it allows uh, lots of diversity of flora species to flourish in this uh, uh, in this environment. Next, please. And in this very uh, small area that there is no more than 13 square kilometers, we see six, we can find six endemic species. Uh, endemic species are really important for conservation, for conservation because they exist nowhere else in the world. So if we don't conserve this place, these species will be, uh, will be extinct, will go extinct. But also, uh, next, please. There are 26 endemic species to Lebanon that are represented in Jabal Musa, such as uh, the Peonia kisirwanensis, that is called after the Kisirwen area of Jabal Musa, uh, above on the right. Next, please. And it's important also the location uh, that Pierre mentioned in the Mediterranean, because Jabal Musa is also represents the southernmost distribution limits of lots of uh, tree species, such as this beautiful juniper tree to the right. It's the Juniperus trepasia that is also threatened to go extinct. And it's important to preserve these relic populations in order to preserve the distribution of their habitat, because the corners of the distribution of each species is the most vulnerable to extinction. Next, please. Uh, but of course, in this very diverse landscape we can also meet lots of uh, animals uh, we see the, the the big mammals of jabal musa of lebanon are represented in jabal musa we see to the right on top uh, the very kind hyenas the misconceived hyenas uh, they are seen here in in almost daylight and um, for example, uh, uh, on the bottom, uh, sorry, on the top, in the center, we see a pregnant wolf. Uh, next, please. And to the right, on top, we see jackals. 
uh, playing on the Roman stairs. Next, please. Uh, and this is, of course, uh, the rock hyrex, which we have. Uh, it's a it's a very unknown animal yet very particular. Uh, we can have like a full presentation on just the rock hyrex. Uh, we adopted uh, the rock hyrex as uh, as our mascot, as our uh, representative, and uh, it's now uh, uh, like it's known as the tapsoon in local uh, dialect. Uh, so uh, before it was not known, uh, and now everywhere we go, uh, kids, their parents, and school children, they ask us about the tapsoon as if Jabal Musa is now synonym to tapsoon. And it's really important here to mention that I first mentioned that Jabal Musa is the southernmost limit, sorry, southernmost limit of the tree species, but for this particular animal, it's the northern northernmost limit. Uh, of the rock hyrex. So uh, it's in between the south and the north. Next, please. And this is another photo of the very charismatic top soon. Next, please. We have also uh, recorded new species for science, uh, in particular two insect species. And one of them is this Micropteryx Jabal Musse. And we're really proud of it. Um, because uh, Jabal Musa was not known, not even in Lebanon. A few years back, 10 years ago, I'm from Yashush, and uh, I know that around me, almost nobody knew about this mountain. And now after 10 years, we have like a new insect spe species called after my mountain, our mountain. So it's, uh, it's, very, it's something really special to us. Next, please. Uh, so the question is, what, what does, uh, uh, the association, APJ, and what do we do to enhance these values? I only talked about the, env the environmental value because, of course, Stephen and Jenny, they will discuss deeply the cultural value. Uh, but uh, what are the activities that we do uh, to, to, to leverage these values? Uh, next, please. First, uh, it's the evident one, the uh, legislation, uh, because the UNESCO designation, it does not give us legal tools to help us uh, protect ourselves from, from violations. Uh, so what we have to do is we, we get uh, as much as we can uh, legal designations from uh, the public institutions in Lebanon. For example, there's the Minister of Environment. And when it comes to the cultural sites, there's, of course, the DGA, the Directorate General of Antiquities at the Ministry of Culture. Next, please. And of course, uh, we facilitate research and surveys. This is, uh, for example, uh, these are to the top right. These are uh, uh, Dr. Jo George and Arya Tame. They are uh, very renowned uh, botanists in Lebanon. They have done all the botany uh, research in Jabal Musa. Next, please. Uh, and of course, to the left here, you see Jenny, Stephen, and Bettina, the doctors, uh, the team of Trio who did the, the landscape survey in 2018. And it's, it was a very enlightening concept because for, before we used to focus on sites, and now we see Jabal Musa as one, uh, one integrated landscape. And of course, Stephen is going to discuss this further later on. Next, please. And of course, with the General Directorate of Antiquities, we work on rehabilitation of cultural sites. Next, please. And the restoration of degraded areas. And he, here you see the entrance of the Roman stairs. Uh, we are restoring it and uh, planting trees in it. Of course, all the activities that we do, they are in, collabor in collaboration with the local community. Next, please. And the source of the trees are not exotic, of course. We grow our own trees in native tree nurseries. And those trees, we replant them in Jabal Musa. Next, please. So uh, how does this uh, all make sense in the context of the Biosphere Reserve? Of course, we can do all the research we can, uh, whether in uh, nature and culture, and we can protect the mountain. But how do we really? Uh, value the research that we're doing in the context of the man and biosphere. We find that the most relevant program is the, is the ecotourism program. Because first, 
the research are much more valued when they are uh, when they are this or, or when when people know more about the findings so ecotourism is a way of raising awareness about the importance of the site and about uh, the results of the findings so this is very important because ecotourism then is synonym to conservation because the more people visit the more they know the importance of the site the more the more they support the conservation and uh, this is one aspect so ecotourism helps in the conservation but also it helps in community development, social economic development. And we have found that, that ecotourism is the most important program to develop in, in, in parks or biosphere reserves because it brings income to local communities, to a, a very big range of uh, within the local community and without impact, with minimal, very minimal impact on the environment. Uh, so uh, I will just show you some faces. Next, please. For example, there are people who rely now on ecotourism uh, to have a, an income and to have a living in, in, in their towns. We have eight guards. And here you see the guard is not only welcoming the, the visitors, but they also explain about the site. And they also sell products, agro-food products. So it, ecotourism also uh, helps other programs to flourish. Next, please. And we have 20 local guides. They get trained about, about the natural and cultural heritage. And their role is to introduce the visitors to uh, what, they, what they understood, uh, what, what they learned during the training. And uh, next, please. And of course, we have the six guest houses. And uh, it, it is part of, we consider them as part of the cultural heritage because, as you see, culinary, culinary tradition is also part of the cultural traditions uh, locally. And uh, this is just an example of who gets impacted directly by ecotourism and how cultural sites can directly affect uh, the local community, positively affected. But there are also many others who benefit, like local shops, local restaurants, uh, local taxi drivers. Uh, all these people benefit uh, campsites. There are lots of campsites around the reserve. So all these benefit indirectly from uh, the visitors to Jabal Musa. Thank you. Hi, everyone, and, and thank you so much to um, Pierre and Joël for that wonderful introduction. And um, I feel like I'm back there, and I wish I was um, back there in many ways, um, because I suppose the biggest thing to say is it is such a, an amazing landscape to work in. And I think that's why Stephen and I are so um, enthusiastic about the work that we've been able to do um, with uh, with the APJM and particularly with uh, Pierre and Joelle. So I have to kind of really thank them for their support and for coming along today um, to kind of uh, talk about Jebel Musa. Um, so as both uh, Joelle and Pierre mentioned, uh, we started uh, working on a, a landscape survey um, in this region in, in 2018. Um, and uh, it was partly to kind of uh, build up and, and add to uh, excavations that are going on in this area, although I won't kind of talk about any of those um, today, which are being carried out by um, other colleagues uh, working with APJM. Um, so what we really want to focus on, um, and uh, Stephen will kind of uh, add to my discussions, um, and hopefully we can have a little bit of a, a conversation about some of the archaeology in the region, um, is to kind of uh, showcase the spectacular nature um, of the archaeology within this area. Um, so what I want to do is kind of give you a little bit of a, an insight into some of the, the kind of methods that we've used. Um, because one of the things that is uh, particularly apparent um, about working in this type of uh, a region is that actually um, conducting what might be termed normal kind of um, landscape archaeology, normal kind of survey archaeology is actually very, very challenging. So one of the things that we've had to try and do is come up with new ways of kind of approaching these landscapes, new ways of exploring um, evidence for kind of ancient occupation and um, habitation within these different uh, regions. Um, at the outset, I should say that um, as archaeologists, um, Stephen and I and, and the others who've been involved in this kind of project, um, have been interested really in everything from the kind of Paleolithic period up until the 20th century um, CE. Um, and so we're really taking a like long durée, um, long-term kind of uh, 
perspective to kind of understand what's happening within these different areas of the, the landscape. Um, I'll talk in a minute about how we've, a lot of the work that we've done has combined uh, remote sensing methodologies um, alongside uh, perhaps more traditional ground survey, but ground survey that has been carried out in a, a relatively um, a different type of a way in some ways in terms of having to adapt to these landscapes. Um, the biggest thing that I just kind of wanted to touch upon, at least initially here, is also how some of this work is also changing uh, perhaps perceptions and ideas about what forest and mountain archaeology is and what it can be. Um, in terms of kind of the, the focus of these regions um, in, in kind of Lebanon more generally or, or more broadly across the kind of um, Levant and wider Middle East, um, there's been relatively little kind of work carried out in some of these landscapes. There's some early kind of um, investigations and some uh, brilliant work that's being carried out by other colleagues in Lebanon and um, from the Department of Antiquities and local universities, but actually relatively little in comparison to perhaps uh, the archaeological attention that has been played um, to um, areas like the coastal plain, for example. So it, any kind of work carried out here really is revealing new information and, and kind of generating uh, new ideas about how these areas were actually used um, within the past. Um, one of the things that we're also very much um, stressing and that we feel uh, a kind of duty to do and, and through our kind of conversations with Joelle and Pierre, um, and this is what makes working with them, I'm not to embarrass you two, but um, what makes working with them so wonderful is the conversation that we can actually have around, you know, how archaeology can uh, be used um, in this kind of ecotourism kind of perspective, how it can be integrated um, and how ideas about ancient landscape use can be used to kind of um, communicate to walkers in this area about the, the sheer uh, impact that humans have had, but also the kind of long-term relationship between humans and the environments within this area. Um, the Tahoon project is something that um, Stephen uh, will speak about in a little bit more detail, so I won't mention really anything about that, um, but is also another kind of initiative. And the, the great thing about archaeology in general is you get to work with so many different people and so many different people from different backgrounds. So um, really a kind of uh, delight to be able to kind of work in this region. So what I wanted to just do for the next kind of uh, couple of minutes is really give you a little bit of an insight into the kind of different methodologies that we've used in order to kind of approach and build up a data set um, for this region. And in particular, uh, the first initial analyses that we did, the first kind of uh, survey work, work that we actually carried out was primarily done using uh, remote sensing. And for this, um, we primarily used alongside kind of um, uh, satellite imagery, modern satellite imagery available uh, from things like Google Earth, uh, but also available from things like Bing. Um, we also employed and used a number of historic aerial photographs. And I have to thank uh, Joelle and Pierre again because they were kind of um, instrumental in actually um, being able to uh, get hold of these from the Lebanese uh, Geographic um, and Army. Um, so we were able to actually access these and put them into a GIS system. Um, and one of the first things that we did, and, and mainly I kind of carried out this, this work when I was um, still based in the UK before I moved to the US, um, was to have a little bit of a think about how we could uh, develop a methodology to identify uh, potential archaeological sites. And this is basically what this image kind of um, demonstrates, is that using these historical aerial photographs, which um, date from the 1950s, um, we were able to uh, target specific uh, locations and specific sites where we thought there might be potential for archaeological sites um, and that would help inform us once we got actually into the field in, in terms of kind of um, serving as a, a kind of ground check um, but also um, serving as a way in which for us to kind of at least within the kind of 2018 season and um, prioritize where we might actually be looking and how we might be looking at the different sites in that area um, and we've used this um, imagery uh, throughout both the kind of uh, 
core area of the biosphere, but also the, the surrounding area as well, really to get a kind of better um, in-depth view into uh, the different types of landscape use. And the one of the huge benefits with these um, historical aerial photographs that I'm sure many um, people kind of here today are aware of, is that they really um, give us an insight and an ability to access the landscape uh, prior to kind of uh, a lot more of the kind of modern development. Um, and so we're able to kind of see features um, and identify uh, areas of sites that may longer may no longer kind of be visible um, actually within the area partly sometimes because they're now covered by vegetation and I'll, I'll kind of talk about that in a, a second. Um, in addition to using um, aerial photography, what we were very um, lucky, and again, uh, Pierre has to be thanked, and also um, Florian Haas and Karen Kapetsky um, here for their um, supply of this um, LIDAR, um, data. Um, we were able to uh, use, at least for a kind of a partial um, part of the reserve, um, LIDAR data. And this is proved to be highly useful, um, again, in kind of uh, guiding us to look at specific areas. Um, in particular, um, something that Stephen will kind of mention later is how we were able to use this to identify different types of trackways within the landscape. Um, and that's something we're very interested in, how people kind of moved through this area, how they're kind of accessing different um, zones. Um, so to be able to kind of use this data and, and um, LIDAR has, has not been used uh, that much within Lebanon or within the wider Middle East. So to have it for this area um, is incredibly important and a, a really useful kind of resource. And so we were able to kind of combine that uh, with features we either already knew about, um, features that uh, we, from kind of doing the initial survey in 2018, we thought um, to be existent, um, and then combine this with using these historical aerial photographs um, and this modern satellite imagery to kind of pick out potential areas of interest that we could actually then go and have a look at during the, the 2019 season. Um, and this is just a, a kind of uh, an image so you can really kind of understand how the, the kind of process was. Um, a lot of kind of staring at the, the computer screen in order to kind of figure out uh, what was happening. And this imagery had already been um, processed when it kind of um, came to us, uh, which allowed uh, vegetation to actually be kind of filtered out. So we were able to detect um, features from this imagery. And I just pointed out one uh, there on the uh, the slide, uh, the lime kiln and, and lime kilns is something that um, Stephen will mention in a little bit more detail um, in a few minutes. So this LIDAR has been incredibly useful. Um, I feel at the moment we haven't got everything out of it that we potentially could do. And with all of this kind of remote sensing, there is always more work that can be done. Um, especially once you've got to know the area a little bit more, you can kind of go back and reassess um, some of your interpretations, uh, rethink about features that you're actually kind of seeing in the landscape and, and filter those back into a kind of reanalysis and a, a resurvey of the remote sensing data. So, um, more, I think, um, can definitely be done uh, with this material, but um, it definitely has been a, a tool that has been very beneficial for our work, particularly during the kind of 2019 um, season. So in terms of actually surveying these different areas, um, and now I wanna kind of turn to the methodology um, that we've been really using for the kind of um, ground survey. One of the things that uh, you might be able to immediately spot by just looking at this image um, of all the uh, potential archaeological features or sites, um, and I'll say a little bit more about that in a second, that we've identified um, from this region, um, is that a lot of them appear to form beautiful linear kind of lines. Um, now, to just give you a little bit more of an explanation about that, um, the, on this image, we've got the, the area of the, the kind of core area of the biosphere, um, and then also um, a number of the, the different kind of hiking trails that um, in some cases are using uh, older trails, um, 
and in some cases are kind of newer trails that have been um, constructed or um, uh, put in place by APJM. Um, and these are in the, the kind of coloured uh, dotted lines um, that are on this, this kind of image here in orange and blue and pink and yellow. Um, now, as you'll see, a lot of the, the features that we've identified actually line up with those hiking trails. Um, and there's, in some ways, three different aspects to this, or, or three different elements of kind of explanation for this. One of them is the fact that, as I, I already kind of mentioned, um, and Stephen will go into a little bit more detail about this, a lot of these are also partly older trackways. Um, so we're likely to find um, archaeological features, um, archaeological material along these trackways that might be kind of associated um, with them. Another one is obviously, as I said at the kind of beginning and indicated, this, this idea of wanting to very much use the work we were doing to add to what the biosphere is already doing such an excellent job of in terms of being able to communicate the rich cultural history of this region to those who are kind of um, taking part and walking along these trails. So targeting those at least initially so we had data to kind of give to APJ and say oh did you know this was here this is really exciting you should you know you should tell all the hikers about this. But the final point that um, from a kind of uh, archaeological methodology uh, point of view that I should really just stress is also it's really difficult to work in this landscape. Um, and I just wanted to show you uh, a few kind of images that really kind of explain why that is. So in terms of the methodology that we've used then, um, in 2018, it was actually a relatively um, short season um, and really a kind of test, test study, if you like, to see what was possible, what wasn't possible, what would work, what wouldn't work. Um, and so uh, we used handheld GPSs um, and also a lot of kind of paper records really to get our, our kind of uh, our methodology sorted, if you like, um, and sort out the different kind of terms that we might need to kind of put into some kind of database or, or some kind of recording system that we could then kind of pass on um, to both the Department of Antiquities, but also um, APJM. Um, in 2019, we kind of developed that methodology slightly and uh, used kind of handheld uh, tablets, uh, which were actually fantastic because they streamlined the whole kind of process um, and made it a lot easier to kind of visualize what we were actually seeing. Um, in the landscape, uh, we were able to kind of put all the imagery and all the kind of uh, cartographic data and also the LIDAR data onto those uh, tablets that we could actually then access in the field. Um, and also the nice and light to carry around. Unlike uh, the differential GPS that you can see there on the top right hand side that uh, had to be lugged up the mountain and then back down the mountain um, each day um, during a very interesting um, thunderstorm, which I think uh, Stephen was left holding the pole, which um, I think he's never really forgiven me for actually, um, as the thunder and lightning was coming down and we were frantically trying to get off um, the mountain of Jebel Musa. Happy times. Um, but also, as, as hopefully the two bottom images show, this is, as I said, an incredibly, in part, densely vegetated landscape. Um, I can't count the number of times I got stuck in a tree, uh, trying to kind of cut through and to kind of move away from these uh, beautiful trackways that the hikers can use. Um, but also the methodology we kind of used was to basically go to any place we could potentially get to um, in terms of visiting a lot of these kind of high place areas that um, hopefully these two bottom images show you. Um, but also then uh, trying to take in the kind of very varied and different landscape types that we have in this area from kind of areas of uh, forest to the kind of uh, deeply incised valleys uh, to these these kind of valley floors uh, with the, the kind of rivers running through and through to these very steeply um, terraced kind of slopes. Um, in terms of the, the kind of features then that we've documented, we've documented nearly 500 uh, potential archaeological features within this area. Some of these include things like structures and buildings, 
Um, whereas uh, some of them um, include uh, things like uh, scatters, uh, so scatters like uh, slag, uh, but also um, pottery um, scatters that we've seen in the landscape. Um, so not all of these are, are kind of definitely um, archaeology. In some of the cases, we've kind of done test areas, um, in particularly in 2019, to identify whether what we're seeing on the LIDAR we could actually see on the ground. Um, but what this just demonstrates is the huge wealth of archaeological material in this area and very much pushes back on this idea of kind of mountains being an area that are inaccessible, that aren't occupied, that aren't used. Um, it's clear that there's a huge wealth of cultural heritage within this landscape. So to kind of finish off my section and then I'll hand over to Stephen, um, I just wanted to talk about two uh, very briefly kind of types of evidence that we've been looking at. Uh, again, really to kind of stress the, uh, the variety of material within this area, um, but also to kind of highlight how uh, this landscape has clearly been used and inhabited for thousands of years. And so one of the things that we've done as part of the project is obviously kind of uh, try to think about the different types of almost landscape that exist within this area and the different types of archaeology that exist. And one of these is something that we could perhaps roughly term kind of inhabited landscapes. But these very much vary. Um, so we have a number of kind of um, abandoned hamlets or villages uh, within uh, the, the reserve. And a lot of these were already known. So for example, uh, Beut uh, was a site that was already on kind of hiking trails and known about and there was um, kind of signs and material up um, about uh, those areas. But there's also associated with that not just the kind of houses but also um, incredible landscapes of, of built terracing within this landscape that really kind of shape and frame um, how this area is being used. Alongside that we have the the modern villages and a lot of these are actually um, showed potential evidence from having been used since at least the kind of Bronze Age. Um, and so through pickup in these modern villages, we've been able to kind of detect their early origins. But then also kind of uh, features that are much more ephemeral in some ways, small kind of uh, shelters. And this comes back to this idea of almost having to kind of redefine what types of archaeology we're looking for in this region and being able to recognize different types of kind of structures and evidence. The final point that I just very briefly mentioned, and this is a subject dear to my heart, um, is the evidence for um, tombs and graves that we have in this landscape. And again, this is something that has very much kind of challenged perhaps our existing uh, perceptions, our existing ideas about where we should be finding tombs and where we shouldn't be. Um, and what has been demonstrated, in addition to the kind of uh, some of the, the Roman rock cut tombs that are already known from this area, we also have uh, different uh, types of kind of tomb and burial forms. Um, and one of these I'll just show on the, the kind of left hand side here. Um, is uh, a potential uh, tomb that we recorded uh, during the, the 2018 season. Um, and these are often built from the kind of natural landscape using the kind of uh, natural outcrops. And then uh, emenage, I think, is the, the term that we've all been using, a kind of uh, altered slightly um, in order to kind of be used as a, a burial location. And in this one, actually, um, potential abacid material was actually found in association. But what's really kind of interesting, at least from our perspective, is these are in very prominent, very high locations, a lot of them. So they're, they're positioned with these kind of amazing lands, uh, landscape views. Um, and it, it brings up interesting ideas about how the dead are kind of getting here, where they're coming from in terms of any kind of surrounding settlements, and why people are actually choosing kind of to dispose of their, uh, the dead in these different kind of areas. And then obviously as the, the kind of top right hand image shows, we've also got different evidence for kind of uh, churches and, and uh, monasteries within the area as well. I'll leave it there and pass on to uh, Stephen now, who's gonna kind of continue with the, the story of archeology span of, of Jebel Musa. Hey, thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Jenny. And thank you to Pierre and Joël for, for your wonderful um, uh, talks as well and for your um, wonderful partnership with us in working 
with the Jebel Musa, which I have to say has been a major and very happy development in, in my own experience of archaeology in recent years. Um, somehow we got a little bit um, tangled up with our introduction, so I just wanted to mention uh, by name um, uh, Tanya Zavin and Director Sakis Khuri from the DGA, from the Director General of Antiquities. I think uh, we were going to introduce them before, who've also been our partners in working, um, working with Jebel Musa uh, in this landscape. Um, well, I don't really know what to say now. I think, I think you guys have said everything <laughs> important. Um, we've talked a little bit about the difficulties of working in this landscape. Um, we've talked also about um, the needs for working with the biosphere and particularly as an archeologist like me, used to thinking about more of an academic output. Um, it's been very interesting to, to talk about archeology span in the landscape um, in a way that makes it a conversation with our colleagues um, working in other disciplines in the area, but also with local communities. So people in, in, in villages and also working in, in the reserve. So, so, so guards and guides and um, some of the uh, other interested people you meet, walkers and, and, and even people living in some of the villages beyond the reserve. So this has kind of changed the way that I've, I, I talk about archeology, span I think, which has been, been great. Um, so, um, so what I'm going to talk about now is just quite quite briefly because I know we're running out of time is to is to talk about some of the themes that that we discussed perhaps in that conversation so talking about um, how people lived on the mountain and how they lived on the mountain in different periods of time so you can see here in this image um, we have sort of we've grouped things by themes a little bit so we're talking about industrial or artisanal if you want and exploitative landscapes so what does that mean well in a large number of locations we've found what you can see on the bottom right, which is iron slag. So we thought, didn't think so much of it at the beginning, but then we started to find it in lots of different locations. Um, and that also potentially is, is, a, is connected to the, the primary smelting of iron, which doesn't really, we don't know a lot about it from historical sources. So there, were, there are some 19th century mentions, but all over the mountain, um, we're finding this. And on the top left, you can see what may be um, a kiln associated with this with this activity, but if, and and this seemed to, would seem to be mostly from the Ottoman period. I should have mentioned that my main interests have been medieval and Ottoman um, in this landscape, as in my other work in Lebanon with the um, the Honor Frost Foundation as as well. Um, here we have um, on on the left bottom left you can see um, a grinding installation, and this is probably of the Roman Byzantine, maybe early Islamic period in another part of the landscape. So here we, we of course, dating these, uh, this feature by its association with pottery, which is one of the main ways we work in this landscape when we can find pottery, <laughs> which, is, which is quite difficult because of the vegetation. Um, and on the, on the top right is a sort of, a, maybe, is, can we call that exploitative? Um, yes, <laughs> maybe we have some stone tools here um, that were found in this location, which uh, Joel, correct me if I say this wrongly, I always mispronounce this one, Aruna Lachash, so the, the mountain, the wild place. And I got it. <laughs> and this is um, not a location where we find flints um, occurring naturally, they're being brought in. And what were people doing there? Well, maybe what they would do there now if, if, if they weren't stopped from going there, which is to shoot birdies, shoot birds going by. And you have hides, hunting hides built in recent years where people get with guns to go for the birds. Well, in the, in the Neolithic period, we have also probably um, local, local inhabitants or people um, exploiting the, uh, the passing, uh, passing birds on the migrating routes, which pass right over the, uh, over the top of us here. Can you go to the next slide, please, Jen? So sort of continuing on a little bit from that theme of, of exploitation of mineral resources, and Jen's already mentioned the presence of lime kilns. We've found, a, I, I think, now seven in total throughout the landscape. And this is a, this is a really interesting phenomenon to find at this altitude. They're known from different places on, all over Lebanon. Um, here we have um, some examples on the left and on the top before cleaning, and the bottom right, um, an example close to the archaeological site of Orna Tader, probably of the, of, the, of the mostly the late Ottoman period, as far as we can tell at the moment, that we cleaned up for recording, for 3D modeling. Um, can you go to the next slide, uh, Jen? Can I get the next, next slide? Sorry, maybe it's because I'm in New Zealand, but I'm a bit, <laughs> it's, a, it's a, little, uh, a little bit of a delay. 
I apologize for the birds in the background too. Well, I don't apologize, but <laughs> um, another theme that we find continually in this landscape is, is, is the idea of the archaeology of the forest, really. It's been a new experience for us, I think, to, to work in a, in a place with so many, so much heavy vegetation. Well, the vegetation itself ends up in some ways to be archaeological. And we notice that when we look at the trees, I walked around initially with Pierre and he showed us lots of pollarded trees. So trees that have been cut back continually um, to, 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 um, to their stump. So you get young growth. And why is that? Because they connect to, um, to activities um, related to, to timber production and particularly uh, what, is, what, is, what is called mashara, so charcoal burning installations. And we found one at the beginning and we were very excited and then we moved on to document something like 200, 250 throughout this landscape. So what, we, what we're getting at with these, with these installations and you can see um, one of the images there, I don't know whether you can see my cursor, probably not. Um, the bottom left, we have a photograph of a, of a, of a mashara in a series of, a series of um, round platforms built with stone terracing that actually are integrated into, into terraced field systems sometimes, but often are in isolation and relationship, their relationship is direct to particularly the whole oak, which is used, uh, which is burnt um, to produce charcoal. And you can see um, in the image on the map, the, some of the, uh, the many mashara we documented in the 2019 season, which was really focusing on areas we hadn't, we hadn't managed to look to get to before. In the middle of the image is a ladder left behind from charcoal burning, perhaps in the 1980s or maybe more recently in, in one of the, the areas in the reserve. Can I get the next, next slide, please? So another type of installation that we initially maybe had a little bit of trouble just for differentiating from the mashara is, is the beda, so a, a, a beda gama, a, a, a grain threshing floor. And these occur much less often in the landscape. They're basically a very similar construction. You can see here in the top left, it's, it's a stone platform with a, with, a, uh, with a lip, a constructed edge. And we have maybe uh, only a dozen or so of these so far documented in the, in, in the, in the survey. So, and, um, and they tend to be more in association with, with villages or areas where we have terraces or sedimented basins on, on the mountain for um, for grain production. Can I get the next slide please? I'll try and go a little bit quickly because I've probably got too many images here and I know we're running down the clock. Um, one of the wonderful things about the mashara is that we can actually look at ethnoarchaeology or anthropological um, data as well and these are these are a series of um, uh, mashara being uh, being used actually in, in, in 2020 in the summer when I was hiking in the mountain outside the reserve I should add we have um, we spent some time with some local guys who were preparing um, home oak um, for for burning, and you can see there the two two different types of two phases and and preparing the uh, the mounds for burning with a row of stones underneath to allow the oxygen into the um, <clears throat> into the mashara, and then um, the oxygen is being closed off the top with with vegetation, and then on the top right you see what we're more used to finding, which is the vestiges of the of the burning. And um, I won't, don't really have time to go into it, but we know from um, historical sources in the 19th century particularly that the production of charcoal was a very major activity in Lebanon and the mountains, and it was exported all over the, the wider region. So it's very interesting to see, to see that activity archaeologically through the landscape and try and understand um, how long it's been going on and how it relates to other set, series of data that we have and the ecological data from, from, the, from the, uh, the, the other specialists working in the reserve. Um, the next next slide. Jen's already talked about um, connections, connectivity, pathways, our issues with pathways and our sites being well, our sites or features being being very close to pathways. Is that us or is that the fact that we can easily get to these places or is it because the pathways are actually connecting to the archaeology? Well, probably a bit of both. And here you've got um, some, some images of, of what, we, what have been termed the Roman stairs um, running through part of the reserve, which is just one of the most fantastic um, features that I've ever seen in, in, in the mountains in Lebanon, a zigzagging up the hill. And we've done some documentation of parts of that, um, which were less, less, less visible inside and outside the core area of the reserve. They tend to link up here, with, oops, 
they link up here with uh, the Hadrianic inscriptions, which I don't think we have a lot of time to go into, but which are ancient, well, Roman period forestry management um, signs talking about. Maybe I should let Joël or Pierre talk about that a bit more, but it's, uh, if you want, but it's, uh, it's kind of the very first uh, nature reserve forest management, if you want. I've, I've learned that from you. So it's wonderful for us to see this from the first century and then think about our mascaras in the 18th, 19th, 20th century. So there's, there's a continuity of forest management going on here in our landscape. This is an area of Roman road outside the reserve that we documented using partly the, the LIDAR imagery to, um, to, uh, to do that. And you can see there's been some road building in the area, which has um, caused some issues with it. Can I get the, ne the next slide? We talked already, Jen's already mentioned um, mapping old trackways. So these are the, some of the walkways through the reserve and in red, um, older trackways that we've either identified from 1960s maps or using aerial photos or ourselves in, 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 in surveying. The next, next slide. This is one of these uh, built trackways. We have them in lots of places and often they're, they're where we know there are routes and, and, and sometimes we find them in completely unexpected places when we go off piste, if you want, when we go, when we've been surveying, trying to be systematic and look at areas of the reserve beyond uh, the known trackways. And we find them all over the place, often in association with masharas, so with charcoal burning, forest management, but sometimes in relation to other things, <laughs> earlier archeological, um, features, for example. The next, next slide. And this is uh, one of the series of trackways that we've, that we've uh, mapped in detail running behind the archaeological site, close to a series of, of lime kilns. And it seems that the trackways here are built very much in connection to the charcoal burning um, uh, features, the masharas. Uh, next one. Connectivity and routes while bridges are a very good example of that. And we, we don't have many in the reserve, but this is one on the edge of the reserve um, near Joel's village of Yashush. Um, it's a beautiful bridge. It's unfortunately got a bit of a crack in it. Um, what we were doing was with our partners in the Tahun project, which I'll mention in a moment, is doing some risk assessments of, of different buildings, but also recording them. So this is one with my colleagues, um, Owen Murray um, and uh, Letty Ten Harkel from, from Iamina and Oxford, we were um, doing some sort of zooming in on the Ottoman built landscape. And this is one of the, one of the features that we've looked at from an, um, from an archeological, historical, and also um, um, building assessment perspective. The next, next slide. Um, living on the mountain, of course, involves houses, and we've looked at remains from different periods, and this is, sometimes they're just a pile of rocks inside a load of trees, where my colleagues are usually stuck, or myself, <laughs> but this one, with the help from the association, we've, we've cleaned uh, a beautiful house from the Ottoman period and, and, and actually produced a, a, a 3D model of it. Um, this is one of Owen's, Owen's images, and you can see here this amazing connection between the, the built stone of the house and the, and the, the landscape, the, the bedrock, the, the limestone background, with uh, the abu, the, the, the terrace structure beneath the main, the main columned hall up the top. These are very, this very common sort of type of uh, building housing that we find in, the, in, in this region of Lebanon. The next one. Sorry for the delays, but I think it's, maybe it's our internet around the world. So another feature that we could talk about is generally is, is life on the mountain and it is, relates to agriculture and animal husbandry, which is rather harder to spot archeologically, but we think we're getting a little bit better. I know this just looks like rocks and trees, but here we have what we think are some animal pens. Um, in some cases, slight, slightly built um, using the natural features in the landscape, but, but building them uh, where needed to close them off. So you can see a little blocking wall on the top right. In the bottom, we have these sort of flat sedimented basins, which are natural, but often they've been worked, they've been walled up and uh, perhaps for use as animal pens at various periods. Can I get the next one? Ah, 
I'm kind of known by my friends and colleagues for being a bit obsessed with watermills. So I'm sorry, sorry for bringing one in, but this is just a beautiful example. And it sort of brings us to the small side project, a side project we've called Tahoon after the watermill, financed by a grant from um, the Swedish Institute. And you can see my, some of the colleagues that we collaborated with there. So this is um, a building which you can use in many ways to, to talk about all sorts of aspects of, of life in these sorts of landscapes. And it's pretty amazing to have one at over 1300 meters above the snow line, as you can see. And this is built in the 20th century, but we had an earlier medieval probably example just next to it. Can I get the next the next image? And here we, with, with, with Owen and Letty, we were able to, I, I don't know, they're jumping around a bit. We were able to, to um, to do a 3D model and really look at how this, this, this building works because it's so well preserved. We have all of the, the, uh, the water supply channels, the wheelhouse um, and the, the water wheel uh, still in place. If you go to the next slide, sorry, Jen. Below, so <clears throat> we weren't able to, 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 to finish completely but we've been able to record it as much as we possibly could. And now this building, I think, is, is, uh, is, 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 is protected as well. So we've done a full study and then, then, then submitted it um, because we think it's of great value. I mean, you have many, many watermills throughout the mountains in Lebanon, hundreds, over 400, um, but very few of them are this well preserved. Can I, the next slide. So the last thing I wanted to talk about with the Tahoon um, workshop, the Tahoon project was that part of what we were doing was really thinking about training younger, younger colleagues and working with having discussions with, with local community members as well about the, the importance of landscape, of sites. People are, are kind of see archaeology as, as, as connected to sites or buildings or, or, or monumental urban areas, whereas in fact what we are trying to bring to the discussion is to, is to talk about heritage as something that's spread right throughout a landscape and that is really connected to all aspects of life in in that landscape. I think I, I know I'm running down the clock. <laughs> Can we go to the next next slide? Thank you very much and uh, some of the people that uh, some of the colleagues and team members that, that we want to thank amongst many other people. Um, so I think we have questions now. Is that right? So I think I, I volunteered to uh, chair some of the questions um, and I've noted that there's quite a few that have come on through the, the Q&A um, for kind of various uh, different kind of people. Um, I thought we might start with Joelle and, and Pierre, if that's OK. Um, and uh, one of the kind of questions it, that has um, come up um, is kind of how um, how easy or what are the challenges that um, have kind of been presented in terms of engaging and working with kind of the local community um, within this area in terms of kind of preservation so if you could just say a little bit more about kind of I suppose working with the with the local community. So I'm uh, I'm gonna get uh, this end, this question, uh, and since I'm from up there, so there's <laughs> there's a lot to explain. First, uh, I'm gonna start with the socioeconomic context. Uh, there are not there aren't lots of job opportunities in the area, uh, and maybe due to the war, many people are not educated enough, and so they don't have lots of uh, income opportunities. So. Uh, uh, for various reasons, uh, some may rely on like like destructive activities uh, to have some income, like quarries, uh, like like massive wood cutting, like really big industries with lots of charcoaling, and without like all of it is illegal. So this has been really our um, uh, our biggest challenge, and we have been also uh, like we spend like a, a big amount of our energy on really stopping violations. Uh, but at the same time, uh, what we offer is something else, because uh, instead of all these violations that are destructive and are not sustainable in their type, because they destroy our mountain, we, we are offer, offering a sustainable income opportunities that may not be as profitable as having a query that would like 
profit one person and thousands of dollars, but it, they would profit like lots of families with a little income to sustain themselves as additional income. And even some families, they live off of Jabal Musa from working in Jabal Musa. So uh, this is our approach. We offer an alternative to these destructive activities. Uh, so this is one like income generation to as many people as we can, although the, with limited amounts. And the second approach is, of course, awareness raising. You, I, I didn't show in the slides. We we, ha we have lots of activities with school children, uh, with the youth, with the friends of Jabal Musa. Uh, it's a group of volunteers. We go to schools. We even have books like the Tapsoon books that introduce school children to the natural and cultural heritage of uh, Jabal Musa. So we start working with the with the with the youngsters because we know that uh, sometimes uh, we are desperate with the with the older guys and uh, but we have more chances as Pierre says we have some we have often more chances with the women we have lots of women working with us either as young guides or as women who produce the uh, traditional products agro food or handicrafts they are more sensitive to the mission of Jabal Musa and uh, they are more convinced with what we do. Um, and uh, sorry, and another challenge is, of course, what I mentioned in the beginning is the legal framework in which we work. We don't have much support, uh, and we feel sometimes that we have to do all the work, all the police work. So we are at the same time trying to send a message of collaboration, and at the same time, we have to do the fines ourselves. So this puts us in a very uh, difficult situation. Thank you. Okay, to jump and maybe go to a kind of um, archaeological question, and, and Stephen, I think this is um, one that you should probably answer, um, specifically asking about Ottoman tax records and how they relate to uh, the Tahun. Um, and also, as a follow-up question, uh, just to kind of uh, answer two at once, Stephen, um, is the, the kind of relationship between the tree coppicing and polliding um, with the charcoal burning and iron smelting. And Joelle and Pierre, you might want to say something about that as well. Um, but maybe we can start off with Stephen and then open it up. OK, well, thank, thanks very much for the questions. And I can see Rosalind asked that question. Hi, Rosalind. Um, well, yes, we hope that there are there are tax records and all sorts of other sources, particularly from the Ottoman period, that are going to tell us a lot more about timber resources generally, uh, but also other aspects of life on the mountain, particularly the water mills. We know there are there are documents um, probably relating to that mill, mill specifically that we don't we don't have currently. I'm not an Ottomanist, but I'm hoping that some of the colleagues that we've worked with elsewhere, particularly um, Astrid Meyer, hi Astrid if you're there, um, would, would, would be able to give us some pointers. We also have some other colleagues, one a Lebanese and French, um, interested in medieval periods. So we, we know there's a lot of potential for looking further at for historical sources and we really want to do that. And that's one of the most exciting things about working in the Ottoman period particularly is there's just so much source material about local communities and the rural world. And particularly in Lebanon, there's a lot of scholars who have been working on that. So it's a really a rich um, field of inquiry. So the other question was about polliding. Well, I'm not an expert about polliding. I think Pierre knows a lot more about it and Joelle knows a lot more about that than me. But what we've noticed is that you can definitely see that these oak trees have been grown for their timber, for, for charcoal. And they tend to be, they tend to be uh, pollarded home oaks, so cut down to the, to the main trunk with these smaller, um, um, more usable pieces grown off it scattered through the areas where we find concentrations of masharas, the masharas that have been used more recently, that is. And talking to the guys who were actually charcoal burning, they said they confirmed that's the type of wood they go for. Um, one interesting thing, which I think the question, the, the person asking, John asking the question was, was, was referring, asking about the relationship between charcoal and smelting activities. And yes, we can't demonstrate that very clearly, but where we do have the, the slag materials and these potential kilns, um, we do have, um, Masharas in the vicinity, and I know that there is evidence for charcoal as the fuel for um, primary iron smelting, particularly in work that's been done in, in the Pyrenees in France and in Spain, in those areas where forest archaeology is is really um, well advanced. The archaeology of trees, if you want. One interesting point is that one of our lime kilns has a beautiful big mashara built right into it, 
at the same time. So that sort of suggests that there might be a relationship between the lime kiln and the, the charcoal being produced next to it. I know that um, particularly the Director General of Antiquities, Sakis Khuri, he's working on, on, on lime kilns and I've had the chance to walk with him in the reserve and uh, he knows a, a lot more about this than, I, than, than me. And then I think there's gonna be a lot more coming out about that soon in Lebanon. Did I answer everything? <laughs> I don't know whether you does you guys want to say anything about pollarding. Um, I think I think, think treating treating trees as archaeological objects themselves is really fascinating, and but it requires new expertise for us. I think, but I'd really like to to look at that to think about the trees themselves and the relationship to the to the features, the archaeological features. I can say one word. When I first started uh, getting acquainted with this mountain, I, 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 there was a, an, an expert in forestry with me, and he used to, uh, he would walk around and tell me, "Look, this tree has been copied before, and this one, and this one," and I would hardly believe that somebody could be doing work at these incredible, uh, in these difficult, difficult rough terrains for so many years. Now you walk around and you almost feel there were people here left and right doing the work. And, 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 and there are two or three types of trees that go well together. I mean, they are, they are both coming out of the trunk and with very uh, relatively thin branches that you, you know they're perfect for charcoaling. So it's just uh, eerie to feel how you are walking among the work and uh, what the heck, uh, interaction of your ancestors inside of that forest and how it's been actually home to them and not a, a landscape that's uh, uh, rebellious or difficult. I mean, okay, thank you, that's it. Thanks, Pierre. Um, so another quick follow-up and, and Joelle or Pierre, you might want to um, answer this because it's, it's on the kind of tree species um, represented within the reserve. Um, and somebody's uh, mentioned obviously that cedar is uh, very well known or Lebanon is very well known for cedar and um, so uh, just anything you want to say further about the kind of tree uh, species in the, the area. Okay I, I want to take this and say that there are actually two very active biosphere reserves in Lebanon. The other one is Shouf Biosphere Reserve which is the grandfather of all reserves. Actually it's, it's the grandfather of of any nature protection uh, in the world because Gilgamesh went and got his cedars from there 4,000 years ago. So this is an extraordinary story to be told another day. So that's cedars, that's in Shouf Reserve. We have a deciduous forest with remnants from the ice age that doesn't exist there, where you have all these deciduous trees of very special that don't exist in too many places out in Lebanon elsewhere. So it's this balance that we have. We don't have cedar, we have juniper. And both are cited in the Psalms of the Bible together, the juniper and the cedar. And isn't that perfect now? That's it, thank you. Okay, I see Carol has appeared. So I'm wondering whether we have time for another question or not. I have time for, uh, I could ask many questions too myself. Um, so thank you so much, but uh, yes, we have time for another question. Uh, we have a dedicated audience um, who clearly would like more, um, so please. Um, okay, so perhaps a, an, another question that we can answer is a little bit about uh, the kind of uh, diachronic uh, history of uh, particularly uh, the sites that are still occupied uh, within the area. Um, and I suppose I'll just mention one thing is that, um, as I kind of said, that a lot of the uh, villages and what's particularly interesting for me as a kind of really a prehistorian um, who's who's suddenly turned to um, an interest in medieval and Ottoman archaeology from working with Stephen um, is that actually um, a lot of these areas that are still occupied by the modern villages obviously have much earlier um, activity associated with them because there is a lot of modern activity within them in terms of long-term settlement we don't necessarily know the exact details of those but um the pickup that we have done so the the kind of collection of the surface material that we have done in some of those um different uh, modern kind of villages places like Abri but even Yashush um have revealed material that goes back at least to the kind of 
probably the Middle Bronze Age, might be some other earlier Bronze Age material as well. Um, and obviously, as Stephen mentioned, we have got kind of lithics in the landscape that often found at, at these kind of high points, um, not necessarily in association with some of these villages. Um, but Joelle, did you want to say anything as a, a kind of a resident, a resident of, of Yashush, um, particularly in terms of how, I suppose, local communities are using uh, the sites, the, the historical sites within the area or these kind of villages. Um, and also to kind of link, I suppose, the, the two kind of final questions that I think really in the, the Q&A is also how obviously um, this links to kind of uh, the Lebanese uh, diaspora in terms of people who've left Lebanon um, and kind of the impact that's have had on the kind of settlement within, within this kind of uh, biosphere area. Um, well, uh, from for the repurposing of the sites, uh, I've learned from from you guys that like the sites that are in Jabal Musa that have sometimes been repurposed, like the house in Nahr al Dhab, it used to be like used for inhabitation, and then it was used as a shelter for animals, and the windows were blocked and all this. Uh, but mostly, yeah, yeah, there are towns, small towns in Jabal Musa and around Jabal Musa. And unfortunately, I, I, like the first thing that comes to my mind is that most of the ruins are abandoned mm -hmm. in, in the towns around Jabal Musa, uh, or they are being restored in a very uh, <laughs> unrespectful fashion. Uh, so I, yeah, unfortunately, there is uh, not much respect for our historical heritage and um, um, but yes, some of the very old um, sites have been are still in use as uh, for inhabitation or like. But yeah, I mean, like the old churches, you would see like some new churches uh, like next to them with big cement like uh, buildings. So there's uh, I don't know. There's no respect for the for the heritage, unfortunately, in the towns. So sometimes you say, oh, "Thank God, they are some of some of the ruins are abandoned. It's but be it's better to to leave them this way than to intervene and destroy them." Uh, is there uh, did I miss a, a question or? No, no. Um, I think there was just a question, an interest in the Lebanese uh, diaspora. If people from uh, Jabal Musa have. Uh... <laughs> Uh, are spread around the world, as we know, many Lebanese communities are. Wow, well, yes. Uh, I mean, I know from my family, uh, like we have, like most of my family is abroad. Like lots of the people in Yashush, they have like family members abroad. Yeah, we have like a bigger population outside than in, in the towns. And uh, yeah, like a residency tends to be seasonal or just during vacations. Um, but uh, they are not very much involved uh, in our work, but it's true that when people travel, uh, they become more sensitive to our mission and they become more, su more supportive of our mission. Uh, this is clear, of course. That's very interesting. Um, so uh, just really to thank you all for these fascinating, um, presentations and um, an area of Lebanon that I have to confess that I don't know, but I'm now really truly intrigued by and the issues that you've brought up of uh, conservation, community um, integration um, are common. They're, they're sort of um, things that we're, I'm familiar with personally from, from working in, uh, in Jordan and um, it's great to hear about your work and uh, what you've managed to achieve and that you're both tackling the sort of ecological and the, and the sort of cultural and the recent history as well. And um, just looking at, it's a very used landscape. <laughs> and so from a very deep part in time. And so you have this real um, symbiosis between the, the human use and, and uh, and, and, and nature there and mountains are always fascinating um, places uh, with many niches and the altitude you're talking about is uh, the differences are, are quite uh, incredible. So well done and thank you very much uh, for, uh, for speaking.
to us today. Um, we hope um, the audience uh, has also enjoyed it as much as, uh, as, as we have, as I have. Um, and this is actually to say that this is our, the CBRL's last webinar of 2020. Um, and so uh, we wish everybody um, who celebrating, uh, who's marking uh, pleasant holidays. And we're currently planning um, our series in 2021. So please do check our website soon and we'll be sending out um, emails with our events. And um, to really just thank everybody once again um, that we can connect um, over continents and time zones has been really wonderful and really to wish you all the best in your work and uh, your collaboration. Uh, it's been great to have you all here. Thank you very much and uh, stay well and safe, everybody. We look forward to 2021. <laughs>